well, we've come a fair way since number one in this series. I've left the walls behind and the painting of the walls and the ceilings. Now I'm moving on to laying the floating floor that goes through the whole house other than the wet areas. I've laid a lot of this laminate flooring for myself and friends and, and for a few neighbours. So hopefully I know what I'm doing by now. I've gone through and I've checked my yellow tongue flooring to see if there are any rises or dips. And I'm filling the cracks with no more gaps to stop insects using them as a corridor and to stop any little squeaking in the boards um, and just flatten it out with a spatula. Not, it's not an exact science because over the top of the floor goes this um, plastic, condensed plastic foam underlay. You can get it in various types. This is the non-insulated type. I don't need insulation underneath this floor because I've got you know, insul bats underneath in the garage. So the first step is to lay this down. Luckily, uh, I've had very little warpage in the floor. Sometimes you get the sheets of the yellow tongue going up when you're doing your own build if you get a fair passage of time and you get rain on it. But having put the builder's plastic over it, even though this got rained on a fair amount, there's been virtually no um, swelling up of the edges of the sheet. So hopefully this is a fairly straightforward job. In laying this flooring, I'm going to follow my basic rule of starting a job uh, in the area of least attention back in the third bedroom and the hallway that leads to it. But to get the spacing and the uh, angle of the boards in that area, I'm going to start here in the main hallway, which is the main focus of attention. I'll put one strip of boards down this wall and that'll line everything up in the area that I'm going to do off to the side. You can get laminate flooring in square shapes uh, and, and uh, sometimes they, they look like slate and so forth. And I have laid laminate flooring like that at 45 degrees to the wall. That can be a very effective way of laying square laminate flooring. It takes a little bit more time, doesn't take any more material a material and it gives you a really good effect but this time it's just all parallel with the walls. Laminate flooring is easily cut with a hand saw, with a power saw or with a jigsaw. I've used all of those in the past but because I've got a drop saw that's going to give me the fastest, straightest cuts. It's not until you start laying your laminated floorboards that you really find out the quality of them. Uh, the harder they are to click together, the better they'll stay together. So, <laughs> duly, you want something in between. You don't want something that's impossible to snap together and you don't want something that's too easy. If I can, when I'm buying uh, laminate floorboards, I pay careful attention to uh, the grooves and try and lock a couple together if I'm able to, to see how, how good the fit is. But if you, if you examine the edges carefully, the tongues and grooves, you can see how well they are going to lock together or not lock together. And the difference between good floorboards and cheap nasty ones to stay away from are the quality of the uh, locking edges. To snap them together, I just use a piece of soft wood with a good straight edge on it and hit it with a hammer. I've used a pen beater's hammer and uh, a rubber one and uh, you don't get enough force with that. And quite often you'll need to have a wedge up against the wall to hammer against or you'll need when you first start out to have somebody standing on the board next to the one that you're trying to lock in. But I've now got two rows of clamps right the way down this hall all locked together. I've got my starting edge for the whole house here lined up off this central wall. Now I can put the foam down here, the underlay, in the hallway and do this bedroom. But to be able to do that I need at this point here to be able to cut the boards off. Uh, 
know, your boards have to be spaced out from the wall to allow the uh, floor to move sideways. And I just use off cuts of the board itself for that. That gives you the right spacing. wanted to get in which will give me my alignment of the planks down this hallway and into the back bedroom. Now we can go right the way down and I know what width I've got to cut that plank up against the wall basically I've got to take the thickness of the wall out of the plank and notice how I've left a gap there for expansion. Where you've got a plank going past a door jam, you can cut the plank to notch it and fit around there, but you're never going to get it perfectly. You're going to get some edges that aren't cut correctly and the, the best way to do this is instead is to cut the door jam off and put the plank underneath it. That way you get a perfectly straight edge of the door jam going down onto the floor plank. And the easy way to do that is to just mark it with a pencil. Where you need to cut it. Then get your reciprocating saw and cut the timber out. With the bottom of your door jam cut away, now the plank can go straight through and you get your neat edges. Just to make life interesting, I've had a crap morning playing this laminate flooring. Uh, I laid all the way down the wall a couple of rows so I could get into the bedroom and start doing down there. When I got down there, I had terrible trouble. I clipped a plank in and then when I went to hammer the next one in, the, the other one would pop out and they just weren't locking together. And uh, I had to walk away two times and have a cup of tea and come back and try again, walk away again. And eventually I figured out the problem is because this board up against the wall is a narrow one, even though I've got chocks up against it, it's not rigid enough to hold the boards when you're pushing them um, and trying to clip the next one in. And after a long while, I've worked out what to do. So I've used cutoffs and nailed them to the floor, taken the narrow strip out near the wall, and I've got... To cut off all the way along the wall now. Once I did that, then I found this plank was locked and I could push the others in and lock them properly. The other issue I had was the ends of the planks where they butt joint popping up. So when you walk up here to hammer the plank in, the end of the plank up there is lifting up. So, you know, I couldn't be in two places at the one time. So I've ended up using a 15 litre tin of paint just to keep that pressed down so that when I hammer it in, I lock it down. I've chosen to show you this because um, even with good laminate flooring, which this is, and with good quality stuff, you can still have problems and uh, end up tearing your hair out. And in my case, it's really serious because I haven't got any to tear out. <laughs> So uh, just take your time when you're laying laminate flooring and now I've got these rows in I can start to go right across this bedroom now and get that done. In the hallway 
Uh, I've only got to go across where the foam is and inside that cupboard, so this will be fairly straightforward. So I'll do the bedroom first and come back this way, whereas the way I'd planned it to do it was the opposite, to start here and go down. So that's just the way the job's turned out. Although the fine details of shape of every brand of laminate flooring vary just a little around their edges, they all have one thing in common. They have one side uh, for locking that you'd call a groove and the other side that you'd call a tongue. And what I've found is that if you hammer this side to get the board to lock in, you damage that. And it looks okay, but then when you go to put the next piece of board up against it, because that edge is damaged, it won't lock in properly. Whereas, on the other side, if you hammer it in with a block of wood, you can hammer in not down there, but along the, that top edge, and spreading the load out over the length of a block of wood, you can safely hammer that in, and because this block of wood is softer than the plank, then the block of wood will, uh, will change r and rather than damage the, uh, the plank itself. The consequences of a plank having one edge that's fragile and is better not to be hammered in, and one edge that is suitable to be hammered is that when you're lying in one direction or the other two different techniques are required. So when I'm lying the board, the board's going this way I lock the edge in by hand by pushing the board down and then to lock the far end of the plank down into uh, the, the end of the other plank I'm putting a block against that edge where I can hammer and hammer the board sideways to lock that joint into place on the other end of the plank. However, when I'm laying planks back this way, instead of hammering the planks that way, I hammer the planks this way. So what I do is I lock far end of the plank in, the narrow lip with that shape on it. I lock that in by pressing the plank down that way and then I kneel on the plank and hammer it in sideways to lock that edge in. So when I'm laying this way, I'm hammering that way and when I'm laying that way, I'm hammering at 90 degrees this way. By the way, here's another essential piece of equipment, <laughs> knee pads. I wouldn't lay any flooring without a set of these. You'll murder your knees if you don't have a pair of those. When you're putting in your last plank, how do you get that edge nice and tight when you can't hammer the end of the plank because of the wall? I'll show you how to do that. Get a nice big wide chisel, put some timber against the wall so that you don't damage your plaster, and lever like that. That way you push the plank back and you get a nice tight joint like that. Sometimes you have to push the last board in sideways using that same technique. On a good quality foam underlay, on the underside, it'll have tape like this for joining the sheets together. Now you put your overlapping plastic down. And stick the other sheet together.
because you have to leave a gap against the wall with a floating floor, when you put a packer piece in there so you can uh, knock the next planks that way to lock them in, the problem with gyp rocking, if you've done it correctly, is there's a 10mm gap between the bottom of the sheet and the wall. And so what happens is this packer piece tends to do that. So I'm finding that because I've put the sheets on properly, this packing technique that I've used in the past isn't working and what happens is the planks curve as you try and lock them and they don't lock and you get into all sorts of trouble and you end up damaging the edges of your planks. So what I've done instead is I'm just as a constant system getting a straight edge and then nailing down temporary lock pieces. So you can see on that side I've locked it so I can push the planks this way and in here I've come through into the bedroom and the study alcove and I've got a straight edge there and I've locked that as well with packing pieces so I can knock the planks back that way. And rather than go right up to the wall, what I'll do is I'll stay about half a plank out and I'll put packing pe um, locking pieces nailed to the floor there so that I can then knock the planks in that way. This is... Um, this method is just necessary with this particular board. It's a quality board from Germany, so it's not cheap rubbish, although we got it at a really good price. Uh, but like I said at the front of this tape, uh, different planks require different techniques, and the difficulty is locking the planks together without damaging the locking edges themselves. To cover the gaps that you have to leave around the edges of a laminate floor so it will float, the way it's designed to. On a new build, you just put your architraves and skirting boards on your wall and cover that gap. However, when you lay laminate flooring into an existing house that has the skirting boards and architraves already in place, what do you do about that gap? You've got two choices. One is to leave the original skirting boards in place and lay up to them, leaving that gap and then to add a cover strip over the top. Your second option with a renovation is to remove all the skirting boards and the architraves and to lay the floor up to the wall exactly the same as you do with a new build and then put your architraves and skirting boards back on. That's a lot of work. So you can tell a house that's had laminate flooring put down as a renovation rather than originally because the skirting boards will also have an additional uh, masking board going around the bottom edge to cover that gap in them. You can get these cover strips in uh, all sorts of finishes and shapes. You can also get cover strips designed for where two types of laminate flooring meet each other, where you've got a join and you need to bridge them somehow and yet still leave that expansion gap. There are other edging strips designed to finish laminate flooring on the treads of stairs or across doorways like across a bathroom door where you've got laminate flooring adjoining tiles. Once again these come in a variety of shapes and finishes and are easy to fit and find.